Hey everybody, um, this is Will Ruddick uh, from Grassroots Economics and I was asked to make a video about our application for the Common Stack Prize. And uh, so there's a few questions I was told to answer here and so I'm going to do that. Um, one was around, um, you know, what is our commitment um, for this nine month process? And um, I mean, our whole team is very excited. Um, we've got about four kind of core devs that are working on the open source maintenance. We've got a field staff. You can see a lot of them here in this picture of about 15. Um, and we've got a pretty big community of supporters and, and volunteers, but um, we're really probably going to need more help on this uh, than we can just do ourselves. So um, I'm really excited about a lot of these processes and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit more here. Um, another question was, um, in terms of the design pattern for token engineering commons, like what do we think about that? What could be done better? And I'm going to say two different things uh, here. First of all, I'm going to say that, you know, we were using bonding curves for quite a long time uh, before even the augmented bonding curve existed. And um, one of the issues with creating governance tokens in a community based on someone else's governance tokens, right? If we consider DAI or the US dollar a governance token of the of the US people, having to hold that in order to create your own local governance tokens is really not great in some ways, right? Um, so we don't want to require that communities need US dollars, for instance, to, to create their commons, right? I feel like that's, it seems obvious. Um, so, uh, instead, what we want to do is give people the ability to commit their own goods and services into a common pool. Um, so vouchers created from these common pools, a lot like the governance tokens created for Common Stack, um, they're in our system. They're taxed via Demarage, and it's a it's an on-chain ERC20 contract. That taxation goes into a community pool, and we want to create some basic voting systems on that pool. For instance, you know, looking at how many of those vouchers someone has over a month. And then they get everyone, you know, after a threshold, get something like a hundred um, that they can vote on using quadratic voting or, or a conviction voting. That's a very simple, quick MVP. So that's something we can do quite quickly. Just just to give you a very rundown, quick rundown of, of how it works in general for creating a community currency. So your hatch phase in this case is a bunch of service providers coming together and creating a credit obligation. And so this is a legal form that they're creating. It, it is a you know a credit obligation, redeemable as payment for their services, like energy provision. They're recording that on a ledger that we call Kitabu. We have our own blockchain. And uh, these vouchers are audited by witnesses. So there's a validation process and they're displayed on marketplaces. So this is this is a, a summary of the process or like kind of the trifecta of value providers of ledger which maybe in the old days would have been exchequer via chris cook here and the witness would be like your mint or your your validator or the sovereign in a sense um decentralizing a lot of these roles like validation decentralizing the led ledger and letting lots and lots of communities come together and provide commons of service um so that's that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. So all that said, um, there's nothing wrong intrinsically with the a a ABC agent or the augmented bonding curve. There's a lot of really cool stuff about it. Um, we'd love to use it, and we do work with donors and donations, and so do many of the community groups we work with. And so if a donor wants to say, let's come in, or you know, a community wants to say, oh, we've got these funds, and they're in Dai or X Dai or whatever, and we want to create a um, uh, augmented bonding curve ABC here and put X million die in there and then create governance tokens together with the community let's say this is a village group or us as grassroots economics and we all get to vote on where that die goes and there can be you know trickle amounts of die coming out and you know reinvestment I think that form of continuous funding is a lot better than um, other forms of, of aid, right? It's, it, it has a lot of potential to it. And I kind of see it as a way of potentially divesting from DAI in the long term, right? And into more community tokens. So, you know, what's bad about that model is that you're still dependent on DAI itself, right? Which is dependent on the US dollar. We don't want, you know, villages in 
Kenya or anywhere to be dependent on the US dollar in any way. And we want to get away from those mechanisms. We want to divest, in other words. So I would love that the hatch funds are eventually replaced with or a combination of community currencies to create sovereignty, dignity, sustainability. So over time, the hatch funds could be used to develop capacity in communities, you know, building cooperative energy infrastructure and increasing the, 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 the supply of the CICs, which are backed by those capacities. Um, and then those CICs could be added to liquidity pools, right, with some of the hatch XDI funds. And that revenue from the liquidity pools can be reinvested and, and created more projects. So here's, I think, a little diagram of that. So here's our hatchers. You know, here's the here's the common pool of DAI initially, right? There's no CICs in there yet. Community groups who have created community currencies, these are local commons that have things like they're doing agroforestry, regenerative agriculture, um, collecting water, you know, doing water catchment systems, uh, educating kids, you know, like all kinds of different service commons are in these communities. These can be created all around the world. And what we're doing with that die is we're building more capacity for what's what's lacking in those, in, in those communities. And based on that capacity, more of the CIC is created because again, it's backed by capacity. Uh, these are service vouchers or utility tokens. Those excess utility tokens are going into a pool, right? Uh, that is then cr added to liquidity pools between DAI and those tokens. So you're connecting all the CICs together. So you're creating a bridge between these two CICs. DAI can still be involved in this case. Eventually DAI could be replaced with other types of stable coins that are full of like collateralized debt positions of local stable coins to water, for instance. So this is the kind of thing I'd like to see with a, you know, uh, if there's a grassroots economics commons where we use the augmented bonding curve and we, we invest into capacity building local communities. And this could involve a lot of the commons uh, proposals that we saw on the commons prize as well. So there's, there was all kinds of really cool um, devices for tuk-tuks or, or uh, tricycles, right? That's an investment into that community. That investment can, can result in excess capacity for these vouchers to be created. These vouchers can go back into these pools and be linked together. Um, and then proceeds from these liquidity pools can go be reinvested back into the in, into the into the pool. So that's the kind of thing. I mean, so I, I think you know, like an MVP is basic voting systems on creating these processes and dealing with taxation, right? Like the the demurrage and Gessel tax, and ultimately creating a augmented bonding curve that relates to investing into these communities and creating a pool eventually, you know, and divesting from the US dollar and creating pools of stable coins um, based on these actual uh, real communities and commons. Thanks. Wow. Um, so, okay, so Leonor, uh, Eleanor Orst Olstrom's Eight Principles, which I love, I think that these communities have a huge amount of these um, um, uh, rules built into them already and I think that you know we want to have more and more but um, so clear boundaries I I really do appreciate legal contract um, we have this non-dominium legal framework that we've worked with with Chris Cook a lot that we're fairly proud of I think that those legal frameworks need a lot of work as well but there's 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 well-defined um, boundaries uh, in the sense of the community defining what their wh what is their commons of service you know what is their commitment and then defining it with tokenization essentially so the vouchers that they create are essentially become this community currency and that's part of the commons. so um the rules i mean the, the rules for these are defined by and created by the communities they're in i mean the smart contracts themselves they have a bit of play in them, you know, like, do you want demurrage at all? Where does the demurrage go? What is the speed of the demurrage? How many tokens are you creating? Well, what is the backing of it? They're fairly simple right now, kind of archetypal. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more customization, especially when we get into voting systems. Um, right now, the voting systems are basically raising of hand. So that's kind of like the main thing that we're sort of lacking in these types of contracts is that people aren't voting yet on chain for anything. They're voting with their hands raised. We write, we sign pieces of paper, we scan that into the PDF, and we mine it into the voucher that they're creating. So it's it, it is on chain, but it's not a it's it's on chain in a funny way. Um, 
transparency, uh, you know, monitoring the comments. I mean, we put a lot of effort into making sure people understand and can see the flow and can also look at imbalances in credit in their system. Where are things getting stuck? Um, demurrage, you know, uh, sanctions, you know, for if you're holding a huge amount of the, 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 the commons vouchers in this case, um, you're going to pay a tax on that. So we make it expensive to hold, right? Rather than expensive to transact, we make it expensive to hold. So the holding taxes, they encourage flow within the system. So that's kind of the point of Demarage. But then also having, uh, you know, other kinds of rules and sanctions, um, super important. Conflict resolution, we go through local authorities. So there's a whole layer, several layers of mediation processes and conflict resolution from local group leaders to village elders to chiefs. Um, and, if, and it can go on up uh, above that if it has to, but we've never seen that. Um, yeah, right to organize, you know, local communities and sanctions. Um, I think that, uh, you know, that that's sort of the beauty of the Web3 aspect of this is we want to give people the right to use a public ledger and to organize themselves into structures that don't uh, include us, right? So we're, you know, as grassroots economics, we're really trying to, you know, try to create an open space. We have our own services that we provide, but they're not necessary, and we're trying to create that larger space around us. Um, yeah, larger, like the whole network of currencies now, uh, you know, the commons of these commons um, is something that we're working on a lot. Okay, last two questions. So um, there was this question around Gnosis Chain, and we have a long history. Like, we started with the original POA blockchain POA that was existed before XDAI existed and um, we had a bunch of problems with it there was a bunch of gas attacks on that chain it was super volatile and we couldn't run a node so we couldn't even make our own gas and uh, so we got off that uh, you know uh, with the advice of lots of folks and uh, we got onto XDAI knowing that oh that's gonna be at least stable and it's gonna be very cheap right and of course you know the prices start to go up and up and up over time um, and it also transitioned from a POA into a POS um, at the time and I, that made us very uncomfortable because we didn't want to be on infrastructure that, that a few elite people were getting rich off of selling governance tokens. And the model of selling those specific governance tokens as well um, didn't fit within the whole kind of community and currency inclusion currency concept. Um, you know, so the over issuance of those, you know, what were they being based on exactly? It wasn't really clear. Um, so anyways, we had a lot of issues with that. And um, eventually, you know, they were going to charge us $20,000 to set up a validation node, which we didn't have. And uh, so we left that chain. We searched for a while. We looked for one. We found a university, one called Bloxburg. But they wouldn't let us run a node either uh, because we weren't a university. And so what we did was essentially fork it. We created our own proof of authority chain uh, with a voting mechanism. We have only six nodes right now. Um, and what we do is we give out gas um, up to a threshold to all the users of our wallets, right? So we have a very simple system that's meant to be humanitarian. So anyone using, uh, you know, di different types of wallets can get onto this list of, of registered accounts that just always get topped up a small amount. Um, so that's that's kind of where we are now. Uh, it's an EVM chain, meaning that it's not hard to bridge. Um, so we're looking at bridges to like Evmos, for instance, to bridge into the Cosmos system, bridging to Gnosis, and having a you know a wrapped XDAI on that chain would be fine, uh, and vice versa, right? So like, I think um, thinking about XDAI and these other chains as marketplaces or places to connect to people, while we don't, you know, like the farm doesn't exist in the marketplace, right? So in other words, like for us, the farm is is helping people have access to the ledgers they actually need to record and, and manage their commons. We don't want that infrastructure to be in these other marketplaces. We want it to be as localized as possible. Um, we're also working on mesh networks and nodes for those. Um, finally, there's a, there's a question around like non-Web3 folks. And that's, you know, um, basically all of our users are not Web3 people right now. And what we've done is we've built a, a two-part custodial, non-custodial system that uh, connects people on USSD, on feature phones, into the blockchain. So um, that's been 
in some ways you can think of that a little bit like an open source version of Coinbase that connects people on feature phones into uh, the public ledger, but now they can move off of that as well. So we're working right now on a, a very simple wallet, a web wallet as well, and a native, uh, like a Flutter app um, for that as well. And there's, there's a lot of um, open source tech around that that's really cool. So um, yeah, I think I'm gonna pause there. I probably talked too long already, but l lovely to be here and lovely engage with the community and hope to do so more. Alright, have a great one. Bye.